we listened to the show on Saturday. From my point of view, it, it was an incredible disappointment because I cannot understand how people, how white people in South Africa, particularly an American who is new to that country, can can pretend that that he knows it all. Because uh, speaking to Arthur right now, I understand how uh, amazing and and somewhat shocking going to South Africa is. But for for this other American who has been there three years to say that he can explain the differences between a Boer and an Afrikaner, he can explain South Africa totally. I, I don't understand that because it's impossible even for somebody like myself who has lived in South Africa all my life, uh, more than half a century in that country, even I don't understand it all because the, diff the changes there crept up on us. In the beginning, it was really fast leading up to 1994 and the first few years after that was frightening because it changed so quickly. And then all the other things happened slowly. You had to build a wall around your house and then the wall wasn't big enough. So you had to build it higher and then you had to put electric wire on the top and then you had to put extra security gates in your house and then you had to hire private security to patrol the street with you. It crept up so slowly that you accepted it as a normal way of life. But now listening to Arthur's viewpoint, I can see that what a South African considers normal is very far from normal. And, and I'm very interested in his point of view because we take all those things for granted. The people descending on your vehicle at the stop streets, the, the funny way we talk, uh, the fact that South Africans say sorry for everything. Um, you know, it really doesn't matter whether it's your fault or not. It's a big thing. We're sorry for breathing. I know you. You do, you do apologize for everything. I've noticed yes, we that. Do. <laughs> we do, and it's it's very interesting to me to me to have these two Americans who lived in South Africa about the same amount of time and have such differing viewpoints. I can't understand how that gentleman could say that you actually you're only in danger if you go into a township. You're in danger just by waking up in the morning. Just this week, there have been, well, today, today, on today's news reports, which, of course, are not in the mainstream media, even in South Africa, three, three white South Africans have been tortured and killed in the last 24 hours. Now, there's probably more that I don't know about, but those are ones that have been reported today. So how, how can people say, how can anybody say, that it's not in your face. You have to be determinedly blind to not see it. Karen, three people in just the last 48 hours, you're saying, tortured and murdered? Yes. Are these the farm murders or are in towns? One was a farm murder and one was in town. The, the two were in town. It was a couple in town, the third one on a farm. Now, this month alone, and these are only figures... As, as I've said many times, to get correct figures out of South Africa are practically impossible because what government does is uh, they put on a death certificate uh, died from natural causes. So you have, you have a cutthroat, you have pieces removed from you, you've been obviously burnt and tortured, but it was natural causes. So in September, black on white attacks and murders, there were 30 one black on white murders in September. There were 41 farm attacks plus 10 farm attacks um, excluded mur mur ex that, that didn't end in a murder and three possible farm attacks prevented. That was in September. Now, this month, there have already been 13, and this was last week, I don't have this week's figures yet, 13 black and white murders, 35 farm attacks, of which six people were murdered. So out of that 35 farm attacks, there were only six who've died so far. Some are still in hospital. Now, we are sitting on the 28th of the month, and there have been 32 farm attacks this month. Now, how can you say that this is not in your face? I mean, how can you not see this? 
Yeah, it's amazing to me that someone could be so blind. It's almost like they were put up to say that. How much did he get paid to say this? I'd like well, to know. Well, where does he keep his head? Because, yeah. Yeah. you know, really, it, it has to be very far up some other orifice in yeah. order for him not <laughs> to see what's going on around him. <laughs> I, I just, I, I'm sorry. I cannot understand how anybody can say that. And then the other gentleman said that... Our figures, now, as I keep on saying, to get figures out of South Africa is practically an impossibility. I mean, you can't even get the figures of how many people live there. We believe anything between 55 to 70 million is the population, but we don't know. Now, he said our figure of 60, I used the lower figure of 60,000 white people murdered since 1994. Now, you know that a murder is not just a uh, drive-by shooting. It's you are tortured, burnt, raped, and, and eventually killed. So I used the lower figure on that show of 60,000. Now, I have 650 pages printed out in single-line spacing of names, dates, and how, where and how they died of the verified white murders in South Africa. They also said that, yes, the, the, there are farm murders, but people in urban areas don't get killed. Well, I'm sorry. There were 4,000-plus verified farm murders, and as I say, 650 printed pages of names of people murdered between 1994 and 2012. So... Although I cannot give you a definite to the last number figure, 60,000 is probably way too low. And the 85,000 number that is also used is probably also too low because it's not, the media is not allowed to report. There are no statistics kept. The police come out every 18 months or so with figures that they say are correct. But this year, when the police figures came out, the mortuary in one area put out their figures. And the, the figures from the mortuary were practically double the figures from the police. So what do you believe? What, what can you believe? You know, it's very hard to get realistic figures, but we try. And so that, that was what Mr. C said, is that, no, no, those figures are astronomical and they can't possibly be correct. Well, he also doesn't live in South Africa, as far as I can understand. He lives in Saudi. We really need to get Lee on because she works in the white camps there. And there are approximately one million and rising by the day. Yes, I would, I would recommend that anyone go to this S South African Family Relief Project, S-A-F-R-P dot org. And have a look at the photos. They take they take photos every day of what they're accomplishing there and what the needs are. Yes. And she works with those people every single day. So to say that there is no white genocide, and, and I'd like to say as well, that genocide is not really thousands of bodies piling up in the street. Genocide is a destruction of a people. So... The people of South Africa, if, if you look at the university riots this week, they were about being taught in Afrikaans, apparently. This is the excuse that they are giving. Oh. Okay, well, here's our break. We're going to do what we can to get Lee from South Africa on right after the break. Stay tuned, everybody. Welcome back to Sacred Cow Barbecue, everyone. I want to give another shout-out to the chat room here tonight, Inside the Eye Live. If you're just joining us, please run over there, insidetheilive.com. Click on the live chat button and you can join the chat. So, and Dennis, thank you for letting us use your chat room again. We appreciate it. And so I want to say welcome back to Karen Smith, the newest host here at Revolution Radio, whose show, Radio Free South Africa, will be airing November 7th from 2 to 4 p.m. in Studio B. She picked that time because she's going to have some great South Africans on, and hopefully we won't have these kind of technical issues. So uh, we want to welcome Lee from South African Family Relief Project. Wow, you made it. 
Yeah, we can hear you. You're a little low, but we can hear you. Talk as loud as you can, honey. I'll speak a bit louder. Yeah, I'm sorry. The complicated way we've got this going, uh, there's no way I can increase the volume here. This is what I call Ethiopian engineering. <laughs> South African. <laughs> South African. They, they say a boo marker plan, which means a farmer makes the plan. And a boo fro mark a plan right back, which means a farmer woman makes a plan that works. <laughs> we just call this food bar. Filed up beyond all recognition. Totally, totally. So, so Lee, you were, you were jumping up and down on Saturday when you heard the guests at Inside the Eye Live. I want to hear what you, there were a lot of issues there. Start wherever you want. Just jump in, and I want to thank Arthur so much. I know he had to leave, and for his insights as an American with two years under his belt in post-apartheid South Africa, that was really interesting to hear it from a, an American's point of view. So thank you so much for inviting him, Karen. My pleasure. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to talk about this. Yes, I, I was very, very upset because uh, I felt that the the situation in South Africa is dire. Our entire economy, economy is collapsing. And to, to, to trivialize the deaths that are occurring daily in South Africa, to me, is unthinkable. Uh, we live here. We see the devastation, we see the poverty, we see the, the we love the, 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 the uh, discrimination. And for people to come out and call us Jews, undercover Jews, basically, and to just dismiss the farm murders and the attacks that are, that are occurring is, is terrible, in my view. Yeah, he, he has a, a real crazy point of view from what I saw. He thought that the Boers meant rebel, that the Afrikaners were crypto Jews that were brought in by the Portuguese. Now, the Portuguese are a mixed race. I mean, there was a time when, when they weren't, but sure, when Isabella expelled the Jews from Spain and that they were corrupted by then as well. But to say that the, the Portuguese came and intermarried with all the white South Africans is just a shocking lie to me. I don't know where he can get that point of view. Do you? Uh, no. I have no idea. And there is no evidence proving his, his statement. We are Christians. We believe in uh, God and Jesus Christ and that he died for our sins and that he rose today and went up to heaven. This is our belief. This has been our belief since, uh, you know, 16 hundreds when, when uh, they came to, to South Africa. My husband, family, his ancestry, they fled Europe because of the persecution that they, they went through. And to be called a Jew so many hundreds of years later is, is stuck in the face. Because we are good, we're hardworking Christian folk. I have nothing against Jewish people. I have nothing against the Jewish faith. Be that as, as it may, we are not Jewish. Well, you're, you're on the wrong show to say something like that because we, uh, we know that the Jews are behind this full-spectrum dominance that's going on in the world. I see the J Jewish communism, and that's all Marxism is, is, is a Jewish construct for dominance, and that is what has fueled the ANC's rise, rise to power. But I appreciate the fact that you're open-minded. I understand where you're coming from and that you've been taught to respect the Jews. I can't even imagine what you must have been thinking when you heard all this. And to say that, that the, it was not in your face, that there, were, that there was no land grabs going on, do you want to respond to that? It is going on. Uh, the, the, the farmers are being murdered, and uh, they, cannot, they can't stay on those farms. They are in fear. They flee their farms in the process of trying to salvage the property or sell the property somehow. They invade the farms, and you cannot remove them. It is such a huge, costly battle to get these people off your property. And by the time you get your farm sold, there is nothing left. 
absolutely nothing. I've seen photos of a farm before when it was under white ownership and then when blacks took it over. And like Arthur said earlier, it's like going into the desert. I mean, it's completely destroyed. Panthers were allowed to come to South Africa to learn some new tricks, how they could further intimidate white voters and, and take over America. I'm not surprised. They're learning from the worst. America, yes, America should look at South Africa and see what is happening to us, because that is America's future. If they keep on allowing illegal immigrants coming into the country and not facing up to what they, their responsibilities are and living off the fact of the land, you're going to have nothing left. Nothing. Well, you, cer- you certainly know that firsthand. We you as shocked as I was that the second hour guest, Mr. C, didn't know what a huru was? No, he's not a, a black African. I, I, I'm presuming that he is more of the, a, a colored. So I don't think he uh, is well versed, and that's why he didn't say. But no, what he did, didn't deny was these four murders. He didn't deny it whatsoever. They play it down. And they ignore it, the same as the rest of the world and the same as our own ANC government, who is refusing to assist our people. They are point blank refusing and calling it ordinary crime. That kind of a heinous murder, natural causes. South Africa is the murder and rape capital of the world. Okay. Yes, black people are being murdered and raped. But there's a difference. The difference between the murders of of black on black crime and the the murders of black on white is vast. I'm sure you've heard, everybody knows. Tie up the father. They rape the mother and the daughters and the sons. They burn them alive with hot oil. They make them suffer in front of this father. And they leave him alive to, to know that they can do anything. And that doesn't happen with black-on-black crime. They just shoot each other. Easy. Over and done with. But with white people, it's completely different. The torture is absolutely horrific. That makes me cry when I hear those stories, that the brutality of these attacks and leaving the, the husband alive so he has to live with those memories of seeing his family brutally tortured and mutilated like that for the rest of his life that is the cruelest part of it, I think. Well, and how do you carry on? How do you carry on with your life if you know that your entire family has been wiped out? And then not only that, the government denies that, it, that, that, that it's a racist act and that um, it is just ordinary crime. The rest of the world doesn't want to know that, that this is a, a, a type of slow genocide. Our people are being wiped out. And nobody cares. Nobody wants to listen. And even our own people, you were talking about the liberals just now. They are, uh, they are BBBEE compliant, uh, which means that they can get the government contract. So they are, are living in the lap of luxury. The other people who are not BEE compliant, who, whose skin is 
white, they are starving in these squatter camps. I work in these squatter camps. I know what these people are going through. My team and I fight on a daily basis just to get food and water to these people. And we are having drought. We are having severe heat in this country. And it's just getting worse. And you cannot ask the government for assistance because your skin is white. We have an entire orphanage uh, that is less than 70% white. In other words, they are black and white children. The government refuses to subsidize or help this, uh, or assist this, this orphanage because there are more white children than they are black. So everybody must suffer. I don't understand their logic. Well, the whites all through apartheid for, forever supported black orphanages and hospitals and schools and all that. So why isn't that being turned around for, for the whites now? How do they justify that? Well, they justify it that, that whites do not deserve it. The lie that is being spread that they were not given the opportunity to be educated is untrue. They were given schools. They had the best hospitals. They had their own, own homeland. They could educate themselves. How come there are black people who are lawyers and judges and doctors and whatever that came out of the apartheid area who didn't go overseas to study? But they had the opportunities, the same as everybody else. But yet it gets told that they were discriminated against. Do you ever talk to those well-educated blacks today? What is their take on what's happening? Do they feel like the whites are respo- you know, don't deserve help and all that? Uh, do they side with the blacks? What's their position? Well, it, it, it depends who you talk to. I mean, it, it differs from person to person. Some would say that the apartheid government was so much better than the current regime. And others would say, well, you know, we stand with what our parents say. Our parents say that we should hate you and that you have discrimin- discriminated against uh, our parents, so you have to uh, die and your children have to suffer. My children were born in a free and fair South Africa after the 1994. But my child this got five distinctions at his matric year. And a black child only got two distinctions, but he gets a university entrance because he was previously disadvantaged. He was not previously disadvantaged, as far as I am concerned, because they did have education to further their studies and to become successful in life. But everything in South Africa, is they are playing a blame game and everything is apartheid fault and the white person's fault. There's absolutely no accountability for them, none. How do white people, like that you work with in the camps, how do they feel about the total media blackout about this, that none of this is getting out to the world in the mainstream media? You know, these people are just fighting to survive. And I see the brokenness of, of our people. They can't do anything. They can't find work. They hardly have any food and shelter. So to them, it's just a fighting battle every day. They can't even think about the broader picture and uh, that people are not listening to them and the world out there is not listening to them. They do understand and they know that the, the discrimination is there, but we are too few to make a stand. We are too few to make a difference. If we do not have international help, we are all going to die. Yeah, I'm afraid that that is absolutely the truth. We spoke about Uhuru, and Uhuru is a reality in South Africa. They had threatened it a couple of times. They threatened it when Zuma became president. They then said it was going to be at the funeral of Mandela. Mr. Malema... Our friend Julius is talking about it again, but he he says one thing in one sentence and another thing in another. But the plans for Uhura have been in place for a long time. It is possible. It is absolutely possible because the whites are outnumbered so badly there that they could uh, feasibly be mostly wiped out in one night. 
And uh, for people to say that there is no genocide happening is ridiculous because uh, Dr. Gregory Stanton from Genocide Watch has said, put us on a scale on a scale of eight. South Africa is at six, which is the preparation stage. And his main fear was Julius Malema, because when the ANC ousted Malema and expelled him from the party, they brought us down to a five again. When Malema came back stronger than ever, he put us back up on a six. Now, what I was saying about genocide, I'm just talking so you two ladies can compose yourselves. What he was saying about genocide is that it is not necessarily the thousands of bodies in the street. It's a a slow annihilation of an entire race. So they started with the language, the history, the the heroes, removing the statues, and and so on. Once they've and done, disarming us. and dis, well, they started with disarming you and taking away the yeah. commandos who protected the the farmers. So then yes. they left the farmers open to be killed. And as for the there aren't any land grab story, that, that the farmers are naturally migrating further north. Well, I, you know, really, I'm a lady. Otherwise, I would say some really, really foul language here. It, <laughs> it is total, total garbage. Yeah, I, 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 unbelievable. I, why, why would a, why, the whole thing is farmers don't migrate. Why would farmers migrate anywhere? They have farms. They've worked the land. Why would they, why would they go anywhere else? They're tied to the land. That's one of the stupidest statements I heard. And the, and the land grab's not happening. Okay, so maybe he is justifying it by saying that the government is paying fair market value for the farms, but they are not. There are farmers whose land was taken away twenty years ago who have still not been paid one cent for their oh. for their land. So how do you then say that that is not a land grab? Oh, that, and, that's and, totally a land grab. And Karen, and, let, let's talk about this stupid statement. He spoke of big companies that left during apartheid and that have returned, Ford, Barclays Bank, etc. Yes, they left during apartheid because of the sanctions against South Africa. But now, yes, they're back. But now, in the last, Lee, they had a Lakotla, didn't they? The ANC meeting to plan their, their strategy for the next year. They had that last week, didn't they? Yes, they yeah. So now at that meeting, Zuma himself said that unless you contribute to the ANC, your business is in danger. Number one. Number two, he said that they companies will have to give 51 percent of their their shareholding to the blacks. Now, explain to me how big companies like IBM, uh, Microsoft, etc., who have uh, boards, they have shareholders, they do not have the power to hand over 51% of the shares to some an uneducated black person. So, yes, they're back. Great. How long are they going to stay? Anglo-American is backing out. They're closing their minds because of all the the cost of production and the strikes and the damages and the murders, they're closing a dozen mines. So that same guy said that because of our strategic value and our minerals, we will not go the way of Zimbabwe anytime soon. Well, how can that be? Um, if, if the minerals are there, but the mine, mine, mining companies are closing down and leaving South Africa, what use are those damn minerals to you if they're in the ground and you can't get them out? So, yes, the companies did come back. But how long are they going to stay there? Yeah, exactly. Anglo-America laying off so many people, there's more white people going to homeless camps eventually. It's got to be unbelievable that you had middle-class people, pe- working-class people that always had a home, that had children, always had a home and a yard and, and a suburban lifestyle, and now are in these homeless camps. Well, Kat, you know, Patricia, we have, uh, people in these in these camps that are educated. Some of, of them have degrees, but because they are 40, nearing 50s and 60s, they are considered as too old, not being able to work, and because their skins are white and they are Afrikaans, uh, they are no longer needed in the in the job market. There's nothing they can do. They lot they they lose absolutely everything. So the African Family Relief Project focuses on these people who are denied assistance from the government. 
and people may call us racist, people may call us what they want. We cannot allow these people to suffer like that. Now, wait a minute. If we turn this around, if what do we say, 5% whites? What's the percentage of, of whites in South Africa compared to all the non-whites, Karen? Well, 3.5 million whites and 70 million population. Okay. Well, let's do the math there. So if this situation was reversed, if it was whites were the majority and blacks were the minority, that wouldn't there be a hue and a cry about this? There would be farm aid concerts. There'd be all kinds of things. There'd be sanctions against the whites for treating the, their poor minority like this. We'd never hear the end of it from the mainstream Jewish-controlled media. Especially with the, with the death, the UN would be yeah, trucked in and flooded in like like in other countries uh, they would be uh, in full force yet to this day 21 years later and nearly how many uh, current 70,000 white South Africans in 21 years plus minus uh, approximately, approximately, Lee, we don't know. I mean, the figures out yeah. there are between 60 and 85, and it's probably more yeah. than that. And, and Karen, how many, how many South Africans, white South Africans, do you believe are living outside the country? Like this man said it was only due to lack of jobs that they left. We know that's not true because I've had your friend Don on the show, who lives in Ireland now, and he didn't leave because of a lack of jobs. No, they no. Because they fear for their families. No, the man. I don't. I don't understand him at all, because they were approximately six million people at the end of white people at the end of apartheid. So, are you trying to tell me that one and a half million people migrated? No, they didn't. Uh, they left because they either had a murder in their family. My, my sister herself left because she was gang raped by blacks. My brother left because he was beaten up and left in the street. So, no, it's not simply because, what, for economic reasons? Well, why economically? Do you know what it costs to leave South Africa if you were to take all your goods and things with you at an exchange rate of 14 rand to the dollar? I mean, you know, really, people left because they are scared, have been murdered, raped, their, their families are dispossessed. They're scared out their skulls, so they left, not because, just because. Well, what I can understand is other countries are taking in thousands and thousands of, of black people. Here you have a white minority group who are hard workers, who would not live on food stamps and government aid. Uh, they are not doing that now. So why would they in another country? Yet they are denied or nobody is opening the gates and say, listen, we know that you are hard working. We know that you are being discriminated against. Come to our country. Not one country is willing to open up their doors and give these people asylum. Not one. No, but they're certainly willing to take your money when you apply for a visa and deny you. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty appalling. I really have to wonder about Mr. DeHewitt saying that his he didn't have an exit strategy. His exit strategy, that he was going to stay till the bitter end no matter, go out blazing. What the heck was that about? Well, if he said go out blazing, I imagine he means guns blazing. Well, good for him if he can get a license because the gun license laws are being tightened up as if they needed any more tightening. The people who've been waiting 20 years to get their firearms returned to them when they get a license under the new government are still waiting. So I don't understand how he could possibly go out guns blazing, but good for him if he could. No exit strategy? Well, he has a, an American passport, does he not? So even if he's permanent resident in South Africa, when Americans get airlifted out of there, he and his family will go. Right, exactly. I thought that was rather amazing. Mr. C had some things. He says that things are positive in the Rainbow Nation. People are willing to work together. I can't even see the whites willing to agree on things. How can you well, say that the Rainbow Nation is willing to work together? Okay, now the, the language in this is the choice, but, but I'm going to read you three quotes that I took off Facebook today from blacks about whites. So the one is, 
this is from a white male model. Can anybody tell me what the hell is going on? Yesterday, I had a verbal row with a black taxi driver, and the man shouts at me to start running back to Holland because you're all going to die. The other one says, we don't give a... I won't use the language they use. We don't give a damn what you think or feel. South Africa is not your country and will never be your country. You will never be considered as being African. We are going to kill all of you pigs as soon as Mandela dies. You better believe it. Black power, mofo. We already started killing you off one by one, and the rest of the world don't give a... Yes. ...about you pigs. You better sleep with one eye open because your time is running out. Tick, tick, tick. Even the South African president wants all of you pigs dead. And then she posted the link to her own video taken on her own cell phone of South African President Jacob Zuma singing Bring Me My Machine Gun. And then the last one, a South African city councillor wrote that uh, we should all be dead. He hates us all, which is now being taken up by the uh, uh, Front National uh, opening a court case against, against him because he said exactly his words here. I will, with no mercy, cut their tongues out with a machete, and I will enjoy to hear them begging for forgiveness and watch them cross the borders with their belongings. So that is how they think of us in that country. So now... But President uh, Zuma would admit from time to time that Afrikaners and Boers were the white tribe of, of Africa. Yes, he did say that. Only when it's 15. Exactly. Only when, it's 15. When, when before the elections. Oh, before the elections. So, yes, they all say the right, the right thing before the elections, but then at that same speech where he said the Africana is the white tribe of Africa, he sang, bring me my machine gun to kill the Boers. These so, people are schizophrenic. Yeah, absolutely. Lee, what help does South African Family Relief need? We need water and funds for shelter because the camps are bursting and uh, there are people living in bushes and in their vehicles and on the street with little children. This this situation is dire. Uh, They cannot stay there where they are. And even in some of the camps, the one camp is built on a, a rubbish dump that the municipality the ANC government has provided. Out of all the land, they chose to put these white people on a, a landfill. So and that, they, and that, that one's Muncieville, and it's right across the street from a black camp with brick buildings and solar that Arthur was talking about earlier, right? Yes, yeah, it's got running water, they've got solar geysers, they've got satellite dishes, they've got electricity, they've got everything, paved car roads, everything. And right across the road from on the other side, you've got these flimsy, put together shack, corrugated iron with no floors and no windows. Our organization has now been putting in floors. We've started to help build a crash for the children because the children are very, very unsafe. And they, we've, they, there are more water taps. There is no ablution blocks. So they've got these porta potties and we are in order for us to build ablution block for them. Ultimate goal for us is to make sure that all these people have water and food and shelter. Unbelievable that people can be in in these dire circumstances in the year 2015 and the world doesn't know. Karen, Karen, do you want to comment on what's going on in Europe, the invasion of Europe? Well, the thing about Europe is I've been saying since I started doing radio shows about South Africa that you need to look at South Africa to see what's coming to your country because South Africa is a microcosm for the... A genocide of whites worldwide. I agree. And, and it was a wonderful experiment because they tried it there to see whether they could get a. And this is my opinion, you know, to see whether they could get away with it there without anybody stopping them, and then they could take it elsewhere. Well, nobody, but nobody, has paid attention to what is going on in South Africa. You will not see it anywhere. So it worked. The silence has been deafening. It worked there. So it's come everywhere. So now these very same blacks 
who have decolonized their countries are now fleeing from their countries into the very same white colonial countries that they had fought against. And now they're going to turn those countries into the same wasteland that they've turned the whole of Africa into. We're allowing them. Nobody, but nobody is stopping them. So that's the plan. The plan is to wipe out the white race, the real white race. That's the, the Jewish plan. And if you heard Blackbird 9, Frederick C. Blackburn on the show the last couple of weeks, he's explained it. He says the Jews believe they should be the only whites. There should be no other whites and that we are the goyim and they need to get rid of us. And it's true because without us, they can have dominance over all the other races. Well, th- that, that is all well and good. But if we had paid attention from the very beginning, we may have had some strategies in place to try and stop it. But because we have all been so dumbed down, we are not taught our rights anywhere. The Constitution is not taught here anymore. The Bill of Rights is not taught here anymore. Every, well, the government just uses it for toilet paper, exactly. It's going everywhere else. And now these people who hate the whites, all these blacks who hate the whites and fought tooth and nail to get rid of them out of Africa, now find that there is nothing left for them because they are not, I'm sorry, I'm I'm generalizing. They are, they are good black people. They must be. But but the the point for me is that en masse in a mob, they are not creative. They are not industrious. You've seen it yourself. The figures in the States are 91% Muslim refugees here are on uh, grants. They, they don't have any intention of going to work. And in, in Europe, they're turning down houses because they're too rural, beautiful houses beautiful, with swimming pools and all, but they don't want to live there. It's too rural. They don't want to know about work. They don't want to know about anything except handouts. Now, what happens when there are no whites left to pay for the handout? Already they're burning down places. I mean, they're doing the same tactic there. They don't like something. They burn it down. So this definitely is the template for the rest of the world. I so admire, Karen, what what you, Arthur, Lee are doing to bring this to the world's attention. And I know we're just little voices crying in the wilderness here, but we have to do what we can. And I thank every host that's had you on. I thank you for, you've been digging deep to be on every radio show that you possibly can and get the word out. Are you overwhelmed sometimes? Do you see this turning around? Do you have hope for it? Oh, well, the one good thing was last week, where, where the student rights were going on. Some white children, uh, students at one of the universities actually videoed them barricading themselves into a classroom with a black screaming and yelling at the door, when we get to you, we're going to kill you, you're going to die, whitey, etc. Now, a whole bunch of us sent that video to every single possible um, site that we could find in America. And four people actually published that video. So there is hope that they might listen to us eventually. But they, you know people's attention span is minute. So they've, they've focused on that one South African thing, and you won't hear another thing for the next five years. So I don't know whether to think that there is, there is hope or not hope, but I can't give up simply because I... I flapping out there in the wilderness, you know? I agree. We have to keep talking about this. I mean, we have to do everything we can because we know at the end of the day, we have to know that we did everything that we could. Absolutely. And although um, we're losing family time and all kinds of things through our concentration on this, it has to be done because how do I look my grandchildren in the eye and they ask me, what did I do while South Africa burned? And I say nothing. Exactly, because it's the template for the rest of the world, and we see it happening. White genocide is going on everywhere. There may not be vicious murders everywhere, but they are destroying the culture of European people everywhere. European Americans, European Australians, New Zealanders, everyone of European descent is being destroyed. Their culture, they are being demonized as being horrible people, and that's the strategy of the enemy 
that they first they demonize these people so nobody cares what happens to them. That's well, how, that's how they do it. Absolutely, Lee. Um, to, talk to us, please, about Brahm, because that is an exact example of how nobody cares. The outcry and then the desertion of that man. Well, I don't know if anybody knows about the stories of Brom. Uh, Brom and his family, his wife and four boys, were attacked on the on their farm. They, Brom was shot three times in his back, uh, and he has a severe spinal injury that has left him paralyzed. Everybody in South Africa, all the news stations and newspapers, and they were all on top of it. Organizations started helping. The family uh, got death threats after the incident. They had to flee their farm and move into a house which an organization paid for. And now at the end of this month now, uh, as we speak, Roman them cannot afford to pay for their rent. Isilda has to look after the four boys, take them to school. She also has to look after Brom. Now, Brom had a wheelchair donated him by wonderful people, and this wheelchair is not sufficient for him. Karen then went, talked about Brom. An amazing donor came forward, an American lady and her husband, and they donated a, a fund for a wheelchair to the value of 25,000 rand. This is absolutely an unbelievable miracle. Mr. J.B. Wells, what an awesome person to allow Karen to speak about what's going on in South Africa. But the fact is that this family now is being failed because um, the story is not on in, in the headlines anymore. And so now they must just carry on by themselves. So uh, we will keep on trying to assist the family some, somehow and with food and, and whatever we can. There are so many people out there exactly like them. Families, mothers, fathers who have lost their, their lives and children's lives because of pure, absolute hatred. Because nothing gets taken or hardly anything gets taken when these attacks occur. At the end of the day, we have broken families that we have to assist. I see post-traumatic stress disorder all over the situation. I don't know how people are really functioning in a normal way because it is such an abnormal situation with so much trauma attached to it. You said in the, in the chat room you don't know anyone in South Africa that hasn't had a family member attacked, brutally attacked. Somebody is always knows someone. I can't imagine living with this kind of trauma as a culture. Yes. Even children are walking around and we are being, we are cultivating people who are living here and, and it's, it's constant. Yeah. It's not one day that goes by that you don't hear of a, a brutal attack. Not one day. People are be, getting desensitized and the rest of the world think, oh, this is South Africa again. But what they don't realize is, I cannot tell you the devastation. And, and the, the camp situation is so bad. And I just wish that the world would just take up the schools and say, listen, enough is enough. We've got to do something and help these people. Because we can't do it alone. We can't. There aren't enough of you. And, and so with 1 million out of 3.5 million of you in the camps, well, all estimates, of course, but so a third of the white population is in the camp that can't even help themselves. And then another third of them being absolutely libtards that have got their, their heads hidden in the sand. Um, or somewhere. Or, or somewhere, as I said before, up another orifice. How are you going to have the remaining third paying for all of this. It's impossible because their tax rates are high. The cost of living is astronomical. Even Zimbabwe the other day, Zimbabwe of all countries, refuses to take the South African rand as payment. So you understand how bad the situation is and they cannot do it themselves. And yes, stand up and defend yourselves. Well, how are 3.5 million people who are disarmed going to stand up and defend themselves against the other 
77 million. It's uh, 67 million. I mean, it's, it's an impossible situation for them. So what are they supposed to do? If the world will not look on and people will not send people like Lee's organization funds to help feed, clothe, and educate these children and keep them safe, Uhuru is not unlike no. In the future, what's the future? I mean, can this be turned around? Is it too late? Can this be turned around? Lee, what do you think? Because I have my own very strong opinion on this. At, at this current right now, I don't believe that it can be turned around because the Chinese are still into South Africa. Uh, they are now considered also a previously disadvantaged race. Uh, we are too few. Our rights are being being taken away bit by bit every every day, monthly, yearly, whatever. You you see a new law being passed that you you might walk in the park, but uh, not not white, for example. I'm just taking a stupid uh, example. Uh, we are being just completely forgotten. Yes. Well, in my opinion, also, there are two schools of thought in South Africa about this. One is that they want self-determination, that they can get their own little piece of land, which they've wanted since 1652, where they can live, speak Afrikaans and rule themselves. The other one is give us amnesty, refugee status and let us get out of here, please. And I'm afraid that much as I will support the people who want self-determination, I personally don't see how that can work because you are still going to be outnumbered by as many to one as they are now. I think it's 20 to one or 15 to one. They're still going to be outnumbered. Once they have an area, a place, a country up and going and prosperous, the history is going to repeat itself. So for me, the solution is get them out of there. But I do understand the South African standpoint that we've been here since the 1600s. My, my family have been here. We belong here and I'm not leaving. But I don't believe that that, that is a safe opinion to hold or way to go no i i it's untenable and, and to me the ultimate irony would be to give these people refugee status in other countries only to watch them go through the same thing again when those countries are taken over i see yeah. diverse diversity is a code word for chasing down the last white person this is not just in south africa it's going on all over and even though it's like we say is that's the beta test for, for this whole white genocide is here in south africa Unfortunately, I do agree with you. Well, we're hoping, you know, we can pray and we can hope. We're looking at America, your elections are coming up soon, and there might be positive change uh, towards closing your borders to illegal immigrants and looking at stabilizing the country more. And I believe that that can happen, and I believe that maybe in the future, America is one of the countries that might put the us open their borders for our people. Karen, what, what's your recommendation? What, what would you say to an American today? And Lee, what would you say? We're coming up on the end of the hour here. What would you say to Americans? It's not about the system is completely broken. It's not about sending better people to Washington. That's not going to change anything. It's never changed. The whole system is broken and needs to go away. What would you say to them to wake them up to this? Like this is what is going to happen if you don't pay attention. Well, I personally feel that every white person on this planet is in danger right now because you're not allowed to be proud of being white. You're not allowed to, you just mention the word white and you're already a racist. So what needs to happen is we need to say enough already, enough, and, and just give over with our pity. I don't like you because you don't agree 100% with everything I say. We have to stand up together with one hell of a big voice and, and close our borders and get rid of these people and use our taxes to look after ourselves because charity begins at home. So we need to, to stop accommodating and having white guilt, the white privilege and being politically correct because that is what's killing us. Absolutely, and it's been bred into us by the media. I would tell every white person to throw out your television Start getting informed. Stop being programmed. I mean, that's why they call it television programming. Lee, I can't thank you enough for, I know you stayed up all night. 
I hope you're going to be able to get a little bit of sleep. I you're much younger than I am, so maybe you can handle a sleepless night better than better than I can, but I really appreciate this. And I hope we covered all the points that you folks wanted to cover because it was a long list of misconceptions and outright just disinformation that went on from these other guests this week on Dennis's show. And Dennis has been here tonight in the chat room for a while, and we want to give a shout out to him. Fetch, we love your show. Dot org. Um, any little bit helps. We yes, a, a dollar goes a, a dollar donation goes a long way in South Africa. Like five, ten, twenty bucks goes a long way in South Africa because the rand is so messed up, right? Yes, twenty dollars can feed a family of four for a week. That's the basic necessity. It, it, it'll keep them alive. So every twenty dollars that you can spare. Please, please, we desperately need it. Go onto South African Family Relief Project Facebook page. Go and look at the pictures. Go look at the children and the photographs. That is the truth. Thank you, Karen. We're, lo- we're looking forward to your show. Karen's uh, show debuts November 7th, 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern, Studio B.